Welcome. Eyelid defects with tissue loss require reconstructive eyelid surgery to protect the underlying globe. And in this session, we will be discussing the principles of reconstructive eyelid surgery and the surgical techniques available for the various patterns and extents of eyelid defects with tissue loss. Tissue loss of the eyelid for which reconstructive eyelid surgery may be required can occur following eyelid trauma, following resection of an eyelid tumor or may occur congenitally. Objectives of reconstructive eyelid surgery include providing stable eyelid margins, adequate vertical height of the eyelids, good eyelid closure and a smooth internal surface of the eyelid so as to protect the underlying globe. An acceptable cosmesis for the patient is also an important objective of reconstructive eyelid surgery. Principles of reconstructive eyelid surgery include minimizing the area of the defect which needs to be grafted, either anterior or posterior lamella but not both can be grafted. So as we have discussed in the previous session, the anterior lamella is constituted by the skin and the orbicularis and the posterior lamella is constituted by the tarsus and the conjunctiva and defects in these lamellae can be repaired by either a graft or a flap. One of these two lamellae should be replaced by a pedicle flap to provide adequate vascular supply for healing. Suture tension for vertical wounds can be maximized, but suture tension for horizontal wounds should be minimized to avoid lead retraction. Meticulous canthal tendon fixation is very important because the canthal tendons are a major support to both the upper and the lower eyelids. And temporary suture closure of the eyelids may be required immediately post-operatively to protect the eye. Grafted tissue should match the original tissue in color, thickness and appearance. Split thickness skin graft should be avoided for repairing eyelid defects and the graft should be larger than the defect to allow for contraction of the graft post-operatively. Deformity of the donor site from where the graft or the flap is being taken should be minimized. And when the donor tissue is taken from another eyelid, the donor eyelid margin should not be included within the graft or the flap and should be spared. For defects not involving the eyelid margin, if tension-free closure of the defect is not possible directly or after undermining of the surrounding skin, flaps or full thickness skin grafts are required. Rotation or transposition flaps usually give better cosmesis than free skin grafts. So far as skin grafts are concerned, for an anterior lamellar defect of the upper eyelid, a skin graft from the contralateral upper eyelid is said to be the best. And for an anterior lamellar defect of the lower eyelid, skin graft from pre or post auricular region is said to be optimal. Other donor site options for skin grafts for the eyelid include supraclavicular fossa and the inner aspect of the upper arm. To select a surgical technique to repair an eyelid defect involving the eyelid margin, we need to know the extent of loss of the eyelid margin. And we will see that surgical techniques for repairing upper eyelid defects almost mirror image the surgical techniques for repairing lower eyelid defects of a similar extent. Upper eyelid margin defect less than 33% of the entire upper lid margin usually can be closed directly without tension. We have discussed repair of an eyelid laceration involving the margin in the previous session and releasing the superior limb of the LCT as shown by this dotted line allows an extra 3 to 5 mm medial mobilization of the remaining lateral margin of the upper eyelid. During this release process, lacrimal ductules draining tears from the lacrimal gland should not be damaged. An upper eyelid margin defect of between 33% and 50% can be repaired by advancing the remaining lateral portion of the upper eyelid with a temporal semicircular flap and this flap is called a tensile's flap. The tensile's flap for repairing the upper eyelid defect is convex downwards. The superior limb of the lateral canthal tendon can be released to promote this mobilization of the flap and while making this flap the temporal branch of the facial nerve should not be damaged. For younger patients with taut skin, this mobilization may not be possible. An elite shearing procedure 
which is usually required for a margin defect of more than 50 percent may be necessary for these patients even for a margin defect between 33 percent and 50 percent. Alternatively, for an upper eyelid margin defect of between 33% and 50%, the posterior lamella can be supported by an advancement of a tarsoconjunctival flap from the remaining portion of the lateral upper eyelid and which can be supported by a periosteal flap and the anterior lamella is then repaired with a free skin graft. For an upper eyelid margin defect more than 50%, a lid shearing procedure called Cutler beard is preferred. Here a full thickness lower eyelid flap is developed while keeping the lower eyelid margin intact and this full thickness lower eyelid flap is then advanced superiorly behind the lower eyelid margin to fill the defect in the upper eyelid. Here we note that the flap is full thickness and provides both anterior lamellar and posterior lamellar support for the upper eyelid defect. After this first stage, the upper and the lower eyelids are adhered to each other and it is only after 3 to 4 weeks are the leads separated from each other. So this procedure may not be suitable for one-eyed patients and for children who may develop amblyopia. Drawback of cutler beard is the small vertical length of the lower tarsus that needs to be shared between the upper and the lower eyelid. Here we can recall that the vertical height of the lower tarsus is 4 mm whereas the vertical height of the upper tarsus is 10 mm. Alternative procedures for an upper eyelid defect with more than 50% of eyelid margin involvement include a posterior tarsoconjunctival graft being taken from the contralateral upper eyelid and used to provide the posterior lamella for the defect area and a skin muscle flap being used to provide for the anterior lamella of the defect area. So here we note that the principle that both the anterior and the posterior lamella cannot be grafted and at least one of them should be provided with a flap. Alternatively, the procedure can be reversed and a tarsoconjunctival flap from the ipsilateral lower eyelid can be used to provide for the posterior lamella and a free skin graft from the contralateral upper eyelid can be used to provide for the anterior lamella of the defect and we will see a diagram of a similar procedure for a lower eyelid defect subsequently. Here we note that this procedure is a single stage procedure but cutlet beard and this procedure are two stage procedures with occlusion of the visual axis between the two stages. Coming to the lower eyelid and a lower eyelid defect with margin loss of less than 33% can usually be closed directly without tension and releasing the inferior limb of the lateral canthal tendon as represented by this dotted line allows an extra 3 to 5 mm medial mobilization of the remaining lateral margin of the lower eyelid. For a lower eyelid defect with margin loss of between 33 and 50 percent, the lateral aspect of the remaining lower eyelid can be advanced with a skin flap called a reverse tensile flap which we note is convex upwards. And while developing this flap, the temporal branch of the facial nerve should not be damaged. Alternative surgical options for a lower eyelid defect with margin loss of between 33 and 50 percent include advancement of a tarsoconjunctival flap from the posterior aspect of the remaining portion of the lower eyelid to provide for the posterior lamella of the defect area and the anterior lamella of the defect area can be provided with a free skin graft. For a lower eyelid defect with margin loss of more than 50 percent a lid shearing technique called modified Hughes procedure can be used. Here a posterior lamellar tarsoconjunctival flap is taken from the ipsilateral upper eyelid, sparing the marginal 4 mm of the upper tarsus to provide for the posterior lamella of the defect in the lower eyelid. The anterior lamella of the defect can be provided with a free skin graft from the contralateral upper eyelid or pre or post auricular area. Being a lid shearing technique, it occludes the visual axis for 3 to 4 weeks before the two lids are separated and thus may not be preferable in one-eyed patients and in children. As an alternative for repair of a large lower eyelid defect, a master disc flap can be used. A master disc flap is a large rotation flap from the cheek which is developed and advanced 
to provide for the anterior lamella of the area of the defect in the lower eyelid. The posterior lamella of the defect in the lower eyelid is reconstructed with tarsoconjunctival graft from either the ipsilateral or the contralateral upper eyelid or alternatively a hard palate graft can be used. Here we note that a hard palate graft should not be used in upper eyelid because of its rough inner surface which can cause ocular damage. So mustardis flap is a single stage procedure which does not occlude the visual axis. Another option for a large lower eyelid defect with more than 50% margin loss is a posterior lamellar tarsoconjunctival graft from the contralateral upper eyelid to provide for the posterior lamella of the defect and the anterior lamella of the defect is provided by a skin muscle flap. For defects in the lateral canthal area, if possible the remaining lateral canthal tendon is attached to the lateral orbital rim, otherwise a Y-shaped flap is developed either from the periosteum or the deep temporal fascia and this Y-shaped flap is attached to the upper and the lower eyelids to provide for lateral canthal attachment. This kind of a flap also provides for the posterior lamellae of the area of the defect. The anterior lamella of the defect is repaired with a flap or a free skin graft. For medial canthal area defects, lacrimal apparatus defects should be identified and dealt with and this will be discussed in a subsequent session. The medial edges of the remaining upper and lower eyelid margins are attached to the periosteum of the posterior lacrimal crest and this attachment to the posterior lacrimal crest is critical as we have discussed in the previous session. The defect is then covered with either a free skin graft from the auricular or inner arm region and this kind of a graft being thin following a tumor resection allows for earlier detection of tumor recurrence. For a larger defect, a forehead or glabular flap may be required but being thick in nature following tumor resection detection of tumor recurrence can be delayed. Early postoperative care includes checking wound integrity, excluding infection, ruling out corneal exposure, administration of systemic antibiotics in appropriate situations and applying lubricating ointment over the wound. After 3 to 4 weeks following the primary reconstruction, interventions can be instituted to minimize scarring and these include avoiding sun exposure and using sunscreens, massaging the wound area and injections of cryomsinolone or 5 fluorouracil Secondary repair should ideally be done after 3 months for situations such as lacrimal damage and cicatricial lid deformities such as lid margin notching, lid retraction and lag of thalmos. However, corneal exposure demands an earlier intervention. Thank you for listening.